Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My name is Victoria. I'm a program coordinator at CLIA and welcome to CLIA's annual law conference. CLIA stands for the Community Legal Education Association, and we're a charitable organization here in Manitoba. Our mission statement is unknown rights are not rights at all, and we aim to bring information about the law and rights to people across Manitoba. CLIA is located in Treaty 1 territory on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. And we also work with and serve communities located in the territories of Treaties 2, 3, 4 and 5. The theme of our law conference this year is topics in family law. So this morning we'll be talking about family violence in Manitoba. We're delighted to have two presenters who will be addressing this topic from a variety of perspectives, including relevant family law and criminal law issues. Before we start, the session is being offered in a webinar format, so as viewers, you're already muted and your cameras are off. The session is being recorded and may be posted on our website at a later date. We will have dedicated time for questions after each presenter speaks and at the end of the presentations, but please feel free to use the chat or Q&A functions to ask questions or share comments throughout the webinar. We will be monitoring both um, functions throughout the presentations. Please also feel free to let us know about any technical issues. So for example, if our connections cut out or if you can't hear or see us. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters for this morning, Stacy Soldier and Wayne Rose. Stacy graduated from the Faculty of Law at the University of Manitoba in 2007 and received her call to the bar in 2008. She practiced in the area of criminal law exclusively until joining Cochrane Saxburg LLP in February 2020 and added child protection law to her areas of practice. She's appeared at all levels of court in Manitoba in both criminal law and child protection matters. She was previously a prosecuting agent for the Federal Prosecution Service of Canada, PPSC, in Winnipeg, Port la Prairie, and Thompson from 2015 until 2017. More recently, she has been appointed to a panel of lawyers by Manitoba Justice to act as independent counsel for complainants in Section 276 and 278 applications. She has supervised students through Pro Bono Students Canada Project in partnership with Ghani Ganichek and will be, a supervise, and will be supervising students again this year. Stacy is also a member of the Access to Justice Committee at the Law Society of Manitoba and a member of the Manitoba Bar Association Council. Stacy was an, orga, uh, an organizer of the Kuiskamon Moot held in, Man in Winnipeg in March 2020 and developed the problem that participants discuss at the Moot. She has been a sessional lecturer at the Faculty of Law since 2016, or 2018 rather, teaching Aboriginal people in the law, criminal justice, and family law child protection topics. She also co-developed and taught the inaugural Indigenous People and the Criminal Justice System Seminar. Stacy is a proud member of the Swan Lake First Nation. Wayne Rose has been practicing law in Winnipeg since 1985, mostly in the area of family law. He's a past chair of the family law section of the Manitoba Bar Association and has presented on related topics to the Law Society of Manitoba, the Manitoba Bar Association, here for us at CLIA, and elsewhere as well. Wayne has been a sole practitioner since 1998. We thank Stacy and Wayne so much for sharing their time and expertise with us today. And with that, I will hand it over to them. So we'll start with Stacy this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, even though I don't see you, it is nice to see you here uh, at attending the CLIA conference, which I think is very important. They do very important work. And I'm not just saying that because I was on the board before, but I did see firsthand uh, the great work that they do for the community uh, at large. And so the topic that I'm going to talk about today is domestic violence in, in terms of the criminal law context. Um, and I think it's really important for everyone to be aware of how we got to the place that we, we are right now. Um, in previous decades, uh, there really wasn't any sort of um, punishment or criminal code matter in terms of domestic violence. Um, but in with Manitoba, the government saw a need to introduce more effective protections from violence after three really tragic events that happened in Manitoba during the early 1990s. So this is where we were starting to see some movement and some awareness of uh, domestic violence. Uh, the, first ish, the first incident took place in 1993. Uh, there was an individual by the name of Ronald Bell who stalked uh, a woman by the name of Terry Lynn Babb. He was a practical nurse at a hospital where Terry Lynn had been a patient. Um, she had complained to the police on a number of occasions that she feared for her safety. 
and she eventually applied to the courts for a, uh, for a peace bond, which prohibited Mr. Bell from contacting her. And so three months after uh, a court ordered Mr. Bell to stop contacting her, stop following her um, for a period of one year, he received a permit for a restricted weapon. Uh, he took that weapon and he shot Miss Bab in the head and she died instantly. Uh, so when news of that hit the paper, there was another individual by the name of Sherry Paul, uh, and she was also a victim of stalking. She contacted the Crown Attorney requesting charges against an individual by the name of Andre Ducharme. She wanted the, the charges to proceed to criminal court. He too had stalked her and uttered threats against her. Six days after she had contacted the Crown Attorney's office, he broke into her home and Sherry and her husband Maurice were killed while their two younger children listened from another room. Mr. Ducharme then committed suicide. Uh, the third incident is probably the most widely publicized occurrence of domestic violence in Manitoba uh, that resulted in a murder in Man Manitoba, at least at that at point in time, which was the Lavoie case. Uh, and there was an inquiry with respect to this matter. Uh, so Roy Lavoie had been in the court system a number of occasions for abusing his wife, Rhonda. The involvement of the police and the justice system began in 1993 when Rhonda called the police after Roy threw a pumpkin at her. Uh, she had told Roy that she wanted to separate. And very soon after, Rhonda contacted a lawyer about a divorce. Um, she, sorry, she had actually disclosed that Roy had attempted to kill her. The lawyer advised her to notify police, so she did so. Uh, more charges were laid against her husband, and when Roy found out through the court documents that she was seeking a divorce and that she had disclosed the murder attempt to police. On January 16, 1995, two days after the documents were served, Roy abducted Rhonda and drove her to a farm north of Gimli. He killed her and himself by exhaust asphyxiation. Um, and so there was a report into the inquiry. And one of the really important points that came out of it was that the manner of their deaths paralleled almost precisely Roy's earlier attempt to kill Rhonda and to commit suicide. Roy had restrained Rhonda, Rhonda with handcuffs and ran a hose from the exhaust pipe of the van through a window of the van. As before, he had started the engine and let the van fill with fumes. This time, he did not stop. And so together, these violence events, events resulted in a long overdue realization that victims of domestic abuse and stalking had no simple or immediate legal recourse when in danger. There was a few remedies at that time that were available, but for the most part, they were expensive, they were time consuming and not applicable to a variety of different circumstances. Um, and so what uh, the, what the, uh, Manitoba government implemented uh, was the domestic, sorry, I just call it by the, uh, uh, the DVSA, uh, which is the acronym that we use, the Domestic Violence and Stalking Prevention, Protection and Compensation Act. Um, now, it's also really important to sort of know what the, the, the type of charges that uh, can come up in domestic violence matters before the court. Uh, so very common, it's uh, an assault charge, which is section 265 to 268 under the criminal code. And so these sections of the code detail the different types of assault and relevant consequences. These include things like uttering threats, um, applying force to another person, causing bodily harm to a person with or without a weapon, wounding or maiming a person and so on. So that's things like assault caused bodily harm, aggravated assault, which is the wounding and maiming of person, um, uttering assault, assault, uttering threats. Uh, if I were to say, I'm gonna kill you, and if the person believes uh, that that might be something I'm really thinking about, that's certainly uttering threats. Applying force to another person. Um, even making the attempt to, uh, to apply force. So someone may try to throw a punch at you, it doesn't land, that's still considered assault. 
uh, sections 280 and 283 of the criminal code. Uh, this also can be relevant in domestic violence situations, which is child abduction. So these sections deal with the abduction of children under various ages and are explained as taking a young person away from the care of their guardian or parent without that guardian or parent's knowledge. Section 282 specifically addresses the consequences intended for those who harbor or take away a person under the age of 14 in contravention of the provisions of a custody order they are lawfully obliged to adhere to. Section 279, forcible confinement. This section outlines that imprisoning a person against their will is subject to being guilty of either an indictable offense or a punishable offense. Uh, the most serious charge in the criminal code, section 229 to 231 is homicide. These sections explain how culpable homicide is murder and causing someone's death, meaning to cause someone's death or meaning to cause bodily harm that will result in death. These are all crimes with severe consequences. And so it also includes manslaughter. Section 810 peace bonds. Even where no offense has been committed yet, if a personal injury or damage is feared, this section of the code allows courts to order peace bonds, which require individuals to maintain certain conditions to ensure peace is kept. And so this is often uh, a tool that is used in these type of situations um, that will have consequences or are supposed to have consequences if the per person breaches them. Um, section 271 to 273, sexual assault. So this is similar to sections on physical assault and its consequences. These sections detail the consequences for those who commit a sexual assault. Sexual assault with a weapon our other offenses after initial conviction are also found within this particular section. And so Victoria mentioned that I am on a panel of lawyers uh, with Manitoba Justice to represent complainants in 276 and 278 matters. And so the complainants are uh, victims of sexual assault. And so essentially I'm appointed to represent their interests during the trial process. And I can answer further questions on that uh, uh, if anybody does have any questions. Uh, section 264 of the criminal code, stalking or criminal harassment. This section acknowledges that no person should engage in conduct such as repeatedly following someone from place to place, watching their dwellings or engaging in threatening conduct that forces someone to fear for their safety. Appropriate consequences are, are, are found within um, that particular section. Canada has a victim's bill of rights. And so this bill maintains that crime has a harmful impact on victims who have experienced it and on society in general. It's important that the rights of the victims be considered throughout the criminal justice process. Victims have a right to ask for information about the justice system and about the progress of their case, as well as the status of the person who has harmed them or their loved one. They also have the right to make victim impact statements in court and voice their opinions about the decisions that will affect them. Following the experience of a crime or witnessing, witnessing a crime, victims also have the right to security and privacy and to expect reasonable protection from intimidation. Uh, the bill also addresses the right a victim has to restitution. Uh, for Manitoba, the main piece of legislation that is considered is the Domestic Violence and Stalking Act, as I already noted. Uh, so this is designated to complement the protections already present in the criminal code. It also offers further protection to victims of family violence, and it's been in effect since 1999. So there are two different types of orders that are created by the act. One is the protection order, or the first one is the protection order, which is obtained, sorry, the, uh, there's a fire truck behind me on the street. Uh, so the protection orders, which are obtained from a justice of the peace of the provincial court and prevention orders, which are obtained from the court of Queen's bench. Protection orders will prohibit the person from being at the applicant's residence, their place of employment, following them, 
contacting them and so on. Protection orders, um, the designates are also available 24 seven at, uh, and so protection orders, sorry, I'm just losing my notes a little bit. And so prevention orders uh, can be made without notice to the respondent if the applicant's needs are urgent. Prevention orders mean judges in the court can order relief necessary to protect the applicant from domestic violence or stalking. It means sometimes means seizure of items used by the respondent, awarding sole occupation of the family residence, or prohibiting the respondent from dealing with the applicant's property. So I think I've just given you a whole lot of information in a short period of time, and I am being mindful of my time as well because uh, we want to respect uh, the time limits here and ensure we both uh, both of our presenters um, have the have the time. And so my experience uh, dealing with criminal matters before the court in relation to domestic violence. Um, it didn't necessarily start until I was about a first year lawyer. And uh, I articled at Legal Aid Manitoba. And before that, I worked at the Legal Aid Clinic, as it was then called, at the University of Manitoba Law Center. And uh, sorry, at the Faculty of Law. And so there was a policy, I believe, that didn't allow students really to deal with the domestic violence matters. And I, I think I recall, even as an articling student, it wasn't something I dealt with. And I think that was a really wise policy because these kind of matters can be very complicated. Um, there's a lot of different um, sort of mechanisms that happen within these type of offenses. And they can be, they, they can be highly emotional. And so when I was, uh, so when I finally started dealing with them in, uh, as a first year lawyer, uh, it was absolutely correct that we were sort of kept away and supported in dealing with the matters. Um, oftentimes the individuals would be male, uh, probably about 95% of the time I was dealing with male uh, accused. And there would often be no real explanation as to, you know, what was going on. Um, it was always sort of, you know, the one story of, you know, she's A, B, C, D, or she started it and it's sort of back and forth. Um, so it was always sort of hard to discern um, what the actual story was, right? Because then you'd have somebody telling, I'd have somebody telling me, you know, I really, I just, I just held her arms because she was going crazy and, and hitting me. But then you'd see the injury photos and it's clear that the injury, the injuries were far substantially worse than just holding somebody's arms. Um, that in itself uh, was, would sometimes be difficult in terms of trying to figure out what your client's position would be. Because sometimes the client would say, absolutely nothing happened whatsoever. Uh, and as I said, the injury photos or the statements would paint a different picture. Um, when these matters went to court, uh, they could uh, went to trial, they can be somewhat difficult to, to do because uh, very often uh, the victim, uh, the complainant in the matter would be afraid. Sometimes they wouldn't even show up and the trial wouldn't go ahead. And that's something that's very common uh, when domestic violence trials are being set is because the victim um, is frightened and doesn't want to proceed and doesn't want to participate um, in the trial. And I think it makes the Crown's job that much more harder. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, even as defense counsel that I had issue with, and I still have issue with, is that uh, the more serious the charge were, the more there's a public interest, of course, uh, for the Crown to proceed against an accused. Um, but in the cases where a victim or complainant really just did not want to come to court and testify and didn't want to participate um, because of a variety of reasons, oftentimes because their fear was so, uh, was so great in terms of further consequences that may happen. Um, so what would happen is the Crown would, um, I, I would hear, I don't want to say it's just the Crown, but I would hear that uh, complainants would be told, well, you know, they'd, they'd, be, they'd sit down and they'd have a discussion and uh, would be asked what if they told the truth in their statement. And oftentimes the statements, most of the time the statements are given 
um, with the not with the understanding that uh, they have to tell the truth and they could be prosecuted at a further date if they were not telling the truth. And so if the complainant agreed that yes, the statement is true, they would be told, well, you're going to be subpoenaed and you have to attend. And if you don't attend, you can be uh, there can be a witness warrant out for your arrest. And that has actually happened. And so it's, you know, we're almost victimizing, the system's almost victimizing a victim over again uh, for not wanting to proceed because of their fear or for whatever reason. Um, if they said, well, you know what, when I, when I spoke to the police, I wasn't telling the truth, I was intoxicated or, or whatever else, they may be threatened and they could be prosecuted um, for, for that. And I see that there is a question in the chat. Um, yes, and I actually one of the uh, so the question is, can you talk about support victims and survivors might be eligible for particularly when they are financially dependent on the accused. Um, so as defense counsel that's not really something that I uh, would specifically be aware of, but one of the things that I um, was very lucky to be part of a project with resolve at the University of Manitoba. Um, so I was on an advisory panel and they've actually um, produced a document called Caught in the Middle. Um, and it's uh, essentially what it is, it's a children's involvement in the court process as it relates to intimate partner violence. And it's an environmental scan of all of the services um, and agencies that are available for victims of crime or for um, perpetrators to access counseling. Um, it also provides some of the information I just uh, outlined in terms of the different acts that apply. Um, and so if you actually want to have access, if you wanted me to send you um, this, because it's a fantastic document, it's 44 pages. And uh, so for example, it outlines um, shelters and housing, um, not only in Winnipeg, but also throughout the province, and also provides a, an exp uh, sorry, a description of what, um, what the agency or organization offers. So, um, yeah, so if you just wanted to be able to contact me, I can certainly provide that to you, and it is an excellent document for you to have, uh, but certainly victims, survivors are eligible uh, under the Manitoba Act for compensation and for assistance, which includes counseling. Um, in terms of what happens if they flee um, before charges are, uh, before charges are laid, um, and they have to go to a shelter, um, I, to be honest, I'm really not quite sure what, what occurs. I think individuals um, and organizations are probably a better way to, uh, are, are better people to answer that question. Um, because I don't think the compensation uh, happens until after or during the court proceedings that occur. Um, is the caught in the middle report completed? Um, it's still being worked on, but what I do have is the environmental scan, as I said, which is an outline of all of the different services, social services, uh, and some information um, and information in relation to that. Okay, so sorry, guys, I'm just uh, trying to get all the questions. Oh, lots of good questions. Um, can you speak to the difference procedurally between obtaining a protection order versus a prevention order? Is obtaining a prevention order quicker? When might somebody want to apply for a prevention order at first instance rather than a protection order? Um, well, the protection order is definitely uh, something that's faster. Uh, I have assisted individuals with applying for that. And essentially you go to provincial court, there is a form that you fill out and then you appear before um, the justice of the peace and it's done fairly quickly. 
Um, the prevention order, I've never applied for one, but I do understand um, that there has to be an application and, oh, great, thank you, Clea. Um, and there has to be an application. So I'm not quite sure of what the process is for the prevention order, but um, perhaps somebody in family, uh, perhaps Wayne could speak to that if he's ever done one of those, um, because I haven't. Um, more or less, uh, for the most part, my experience has been with the, uh, the protection order uh, in particular. Um, So in terms of um, criminal law and the process for criminal law, um, if I were to have a file um, in relation to the, uh, a domestic violence matter, uh, an assault or an utter threats, um, if the individual doesn't have a, a prior criminal record or a limited criminal record or even no criminal record in relation to domestic violence matters, uh, very often, uh, a person like that will would be referred to a, a diversion program uh, to take counseling. And so there's a number of different diversion programs in Winnipeg, but the most popular one generally is Spirit of Peace, which is offered through Mama Way. And that's because it's offered at night. So if individuals are working during the day, um, um, it's, easy, it's much more accessible for them to attend. Um, and that type of program it involves um, counseling, uh, group group therapy, and uh, some work that goes into work that goes into it, where they assess uh, how well the person has uh, done within the program. Um, mediation services in this particular instance is not appropriate because of the power imbalance. I think I've never had anyone attend to mediation services. Um, I can tell you that uh, very rarely do we see, have I ever seen domestic violence between youths under the YCGA, um, and the Crowns and the youth unit generally take that very, very seriously because it's, it's very concerning if we're seeing 15, 16-year-old um, normally boys in the, these instances um, having this type of issue where they're assaulting their partner. Um, so I think in the two cases that I had, neither of them uh, were sent to diversion, um, but were sent to uh, forensics to get, uh, sorry, the MATC to get a formal report. Uh, and I think one went to trial and ended up with a conviction and the other was a, a guilty plea, if I can recall that correctly. Um, but the diversion program, once that is complete, Oftentimes it does end with a peace bond unless there is information from the complainant that they want to reunify and resume a relationship. Um, I can tell you that the Crown attorneys who deal with domestic violence are very, very cautious uh, and I think are very good at their jobs in terms of doing an assessment of the risk. Um, I know, and this hasn't come from any of my clients, but I know that there's times where Crown attorney uh, individuals have told some of my friends who are crown attorneys have said, you know, they receive calls from victim services or the victim themselves were very adamant that they want the charges dropped or whatever else. So there's always concern, as I said, about the power imbalance that occurs. Um, so in terms of uh, the court processes as well, um, my work, uh, working with sexual assault victims, um, in those matters, it's a very delicate process because the individuals, um, the victims have a significant amount of trauma uh, because of what had occurred. Um, my role is to protect their interests um, and ensure some, some measure of privacy is allotted to them. And so those applications, 276 and 271 applications, are applications either to obtain some sort of records, whether it's counseling records, child and family services records, um, medical records, things of that nature. And so my, my role in that is to review those records, to talk to my client, to um, see if there's anything that in particular that is going to affect their privacy rights. Um, 
The 276 applications are somewhat more involved. Um, they can be very, very emotional. And what those applications are, are applications that defense counsel makes to be able to question the complainant about previous sexual activity. Um, and so um, that kind of thing, uh, from my perspective, my first, uh, my first line of defense is that this is not relevant, whether or not she agreed to have consensual sex or he agreed to have consensual sex um, hours before, days before, with who or whoever is not relevant in, in this particular matter. Um, and so there's often a very involved process, uh, including uh, appearances before, before judges, as well as submissions that happen. Um, I know at one instance, uh, I did have to send a letter to Winnipeg police because uh, of the experience the complainant had with the initial police officers who really downplayed um, what happened to her and were very dismissive. And what the, what's really clear is that oftentimes women um, and victims do not want to make, um, make a statement against anybody or go forward with charges. And it's attitudes like that, uh, which makes it all the more harder because certainly in this particular instance, um, the complainant really didn't wanna go ahead um, after this first encounter with the police officer. Um, so uh, as I said, that's one of the roles that I have and I just wanna be mindful of my time. Um, you know what? I actually think I am out of time. Um, so if there's any other questions in terms of the processes, um, I think we do have some time. Victoria, if you were gonna be coming back. Yes, certainly. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, so if anybody has any further questions for Stacey right now, um, we can certainly take a few minutes for that. Um, if nobody has questions now, we can also uh, move on to Wayne and there will be time for questions at the end as well in case anybody has questions for both presenters. Um, but maybe we'll leave the chat open for a few moments um, so people can type in if they need. Okay, not seeing anything just yet. So maybe we'll move on to Wayne. Thank you so much, Stacey. Yes, thank um, you, everybody. Perfect. Wayne, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, well, firstly, thank you, Stacey. I've learned a few things today, and that's important because my experience is that there's a lot of interplay between the criminal and family law sides in these matters. Um, it's often been said that hard cases make bad law. And it's certainly true that cases involving family violence are hard. Uh, there's a wide range of actions that may or may not constitute abuse or, or violence. Uh, it's often contextual. Uh, what appear to be small conflicts can actually be extremely important and, and have big effects on the victims. Um, they're often hard to prove uh, because, of course, people don't generally do their domestic violence at Portage in Maine or in the mall, they wait until they get home and then there are no witnesses. And unfortunately, especially in long-term violence situations, uh, victims often aren't great witnesses and, and that can make, diff make your case difficult. Uh, also, these matters tend to be closely tied up with other issues, issues of parenting, uh, financial issues. I think someone asked a question about that. I'm gonna mention that briefly. Um, but having said all of that, it took them a while, but our legislatures uh, did eventually uh, and continue to acknowledge that this is an important issue. Uh, so there is legislation that tries to address these matters. Uh, Stacy has talked about the criminal side. I'm gonna spend some time talking about the family law side. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about three particular pieces of legislation uh, and uh, situations where a, a slightly sort of a side process, uh, another process may become involved with the family law matters. I'm going to add a few comments about the Domestic Violence and Stalking Act from the, from the uh, point of view of a family lawyer, because we deal with this quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Family Maintenance Act, uh, how child protection matters can often become issues in these matters. And finally, uh, there are some new 
uh, provisions in the Divorce Act that have only been in play now, have only been in effect for about a year. And uh, I'm going to talk about them and how uh, that may factor into these matters in the future. Um, a couple of things about the Domestic Violence and Stalking Act, the, the protection order is sort of the, the front line response. It's the one you can get right away. Uh, and, and this is really important. It's the one you can get without telling the other side you're doing it. Um, and, and I have certainly uh, had situations where people have come to me and uh, said, I was basically awakened at two in the morning after having an, what I thought was an argument with my spouse. Um, and, and that spouse had left and I was awakened at two in the morning by the police who said, uh, this person has a protection order, get out of the house uh, and stay away from them. Uh, you can get a lot of pretty strong uh, relief or remedy uh, without any notice to the other side. And in a very uh, summary process, it, it, typically you walk into the courthouse and you walk out with an order in hand, uh, and that order is immediately sent to the police who are responsible for serving it, which uh, is certainly an advantage because it means you don't have to do the kinds of uh, services that we typically face in civil matters. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of the provisions of the act. Um, there's a sort of a threshold issue. You have to prove that there's been domestic violence or stalking, and there are some restrictions on that. Uh, domestic violence only applies to certain people in certain situations, whereas stalking applies in all situations and to anyone. Uh, it's important to know that there's no uh, gender discrimination. Uh, it applies to same uh, same gender couples or same gender relationships in the same way that it uh, would apply to anyone else. Um, the other thing is, in terms of the uh, uh, couple of other things on the protection order, one is that a protection order is subject to a three-year limit. It ends after three years unless you apply to increase it. Uh, the other thing that's important is, and this is particularly because it is done without notice to the other side, uh, the person who ha against whom the order has been made has the ability to chan challenge the order after the fact, after they're served, but they're subject to some very strict timelines. You have to bring your application within 20 days, uh, which may sound like a lot of time, but when you're trying to deal with an application where you have really no knowledge of, of what happened uh, and, until somebody dropped an order in front of you uh, and you have to try and perhaps get to see a lawyer uh, bring an application before the court, uh, file your own evidence and so on, 20 days isn't a long time. Uh, so if people are dealing with a situation where they want to challenge one of these orders, uh, they have to get to it and they have to pay attention to it. They can't just wait and uh, hope something goes away. Uh, the other thing is prevention orders, as uh, Stacy mentioned uh, about those, a prevention order is a more traditional uh, application to the court. It's done through the Court of Queen's Bench, uh, through typically through the family division, although it can be done in the general division, depending on the relationship involved. Uh, judges make prevention orders uh, as opposed to justices of the peace, and that means you have to get in front of the judge, which can itself be a significant uh, and time-consuming process. You have to provide notice to the other party. The other party has a chance to respond, and Prevention orders are often sought as part of a larger case. So as part of a divorce case that may involve custody and access issues or parenting issues, it may involve support or other financial issues. It, it's one of many pieces uh, to the case in, in cases like that. Um, the other thing about prevention orders is that they are not time limited, unlike the protection order. Uh, basically, the judge pronounces it and until the judge says otherwise, the order is in effect. Uh, they also provide for some additional relief, probably the most significant of which, although I don't, my experience is it's used very rarely, but it's the prevention order that provides uh, for the opportunity to ask for compensation uh, by the victim uh, from the perpetrator of the family violence. Um, the other thing is that for either order, be it a prevention order or a protection order, uh, either party can subsequently apply to have it changed or varied. Uh, they have to show a change in circumstances, and that's different from setting it aside so that there aren't the same time limits on that. Um, 
as I said, a protection order can give you an awful lot of um, uh, relief, uh, some very strong relief in a very short time. It can engage the long arm of the law, the police and, and courts in, in, in enforcing that. One of the things we see a lot, uh, and I suspect this is also true on the, on the uh, I know it's also true on the criminal side, uh, is breaches of these orders. Breaches of these orders are criminal offenses. Uh, it's, a, it's a criminal offense to breach a court order, and that definitely applies to protection and prevention orders. And I know that um, it is far from unusual for people to come in and say to us, well, I've got a protection order against me, and now I've also got three charges of breach because I called my spouse for whatever stupid reason I called my spouse. Um, and those are also dealt with on, on the criminal side. Um, they are, they, they are and they can be subject to uh, abuse. Um, I know that uh, when you read the transcripts of the hearings, and there are hearings involved with protection orders, what you very often read is that the Justice of the Peace pretty much walks the person through it to get them to the desired result, gets them to say the things that they need to say uh, that they probably wouldn't get to on their own. Um, and quite frankly, if someone is prepared to exaggerate or lie, uh, they can get an order without any challenge until quite some time later. Uh, and, and I don't propose or suggest that that's the usual case. I think in the usual case, uh, these orders are obtained because they're needed. Uh, but they are somewhat subject to abuse, but they can also be life-saving. Um, important points in addition to the breach issue is these orders are uh, put on the police computer system, the CPIC system. That means that they're available to the police uh, any time that they're uh, in their car, basically. Uh, and those records are available to them and they can, if they're called to a further disturbance or a problem, uh, they can check and find out that this person may be subject to, a, subject to and breaching uh, a protection order. All right, I, I will leave that. Stacy has already dealt with these matters at uh, some length and I'll, uh, I'll just move on to some other issues. The Family Maintenance Act, which is sort of the broad act uh, in Manitoba that deals with uh, issues such as separation, uh, child-related uh, issues uh, such as parenting, custody access, support issues, uh, and, and some other issues, uh, is soon to be uh, replaced, we're told, um, with new legislation, but I expect the new legislation is going to uh, have provisions similar to the ones I'm about to describe to you. Uh, the Family Maintenance Act allows a judge or, or gives a judge authority to make some specific orders that would apply in a domestic violence situation. One is that they can order sole occupancy of a residence. That is to say, they can say to one person or the other, you have the right to stay in this house or this apartment or this condominium, uh, and the other party does not have the right to be there any longer. Uh, and they can make such an order regardless of who owns the property or who is the lessee of the property. Uh, so we have certainly, and we do, uh, see orders made uh, to say essentially the, um, the victim of abuse can stay in the home often with the children, uh, and the other person has to leave even though it may be their home or their house. The second order that the court can make, and I'm, I'm going to speci specifically quote this one to you, um, is that communication and contact between the spouses or common law partners be prohibited or restricted, and the order can be subject to such terms and conditions as the court may consider just. So that covers some of the same uh, ground as protection and prevention orders. Um, what I'm seeing, uh, and I think some of my colleagues uh, are also seeing this, is that for a variety of reasons, the judges seem to be inclined to invoke the provisions of the Family Maintenance Act um, as sort of a replacement for orders that have made un been made under the domestic violence uh, legislation. Uh, I, I think they're doing that because it may be somewhat more flexible. Uh, I think they're also doing it because they can make it as an, 
uh, what we call an interim order, which is subject to an ultimate hearing. Um, just to go back for a second, uh, these protection orders, when they are challenged, uh, they are challenged in a trial, uh, but it's a fairly summary trial in the sense that usually the parties both provide affidavit evidence and then the other side has the opportunity or the lawyer has the opportunity to cross-examine them uh, on that evidence. Uh, those trials are typically a half day or a day as opposed to a typical family trial, which might be anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. The other thing to be aware of, and I mentioned this in passing, is uh, of course, when people uh, do violence to children um, in particular, uh, or when children are placed at risk of violence, uh, that can invoke the jurisdiction under the Child and Family Services Act, which provides for uh, protection of children and prevention of the neglect of children. And those, um, those powers are exercised by child protection agencies, such as Child and Family Services. Uh, and there are numbers of agencies within the province that have different jurisdictions within different communities, uh, but they are the ones who actually exercise those powers. Um, and family lawyers, as a general rule, are reluctant to get child protection agencies involved because once you've sort of set that ball rolling, you don't control it anymore. Uh, and uh, depending on what comes out, it may be your own client that uh, has as much grief through the process as the other client. That being said, where there's a legitimate child protection concern where someone has been violent to children or looks like they may very well be violent to children, uh, it is certainly uh, puts the, uh, the victim or, or the, the spouse who isn't the, the, the perpetrator in a much stronger position to have a child protection agency either at court with them or a letter from a child protection agency saying this other person should not have access to these children and in extreme cases, not only do we not think they should have access, but if anybody gives them access, we're going to apprehend the child and take them into care. Uh, that kind of cuts out uh, or can cut out uh, a lot of uh, the, the trouble of going through these matters and trying to prove a case that may be difficult to prove in other circumstances. <clears throat> I mentioned the Divorce Act, um, and the Divorce Act also, being federal legislation, it also deals with matters of uh, custody and access, as we used to call them, and what is now called parenting. Uh, in other words, where the children should live and for what periods, what kind of relationship they should have with each parent, uh, when and for how long, uh, and how decisions get made about those children. Uh, the Divorce Act was amended fairly extensively about a year ago. Um, and one of those amendments uh, deals with parenting uh, and talks about, uh, as it always has, by the way, uh, talks about the primary concern being the best interests of the children. The difference uh, that has now been introduced to the legislation or to the Divorce Act is that in addition to just saying the court shall take into consideration only the best interests of the children, they go on to say, when considering the factors referred to in this legislation, that is factors to make a decision about parenting, um, the court shall give primary consideration to the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety, security, and well-being. That's new. Uh, what's also new is that the Divorce Act now has a list of factors for a court to consider when they're thinking about access or parenting decisions. And of the 11 factors cited, three of them are, one is uh, the ability and willingness of each person in respect of whom the order would apply to communicate and cooperate in particular with one another on matters affecting the child. So if there's an order in effect that says these people can't have any contact or communication, uh, clearly that's going to affect that factor. Uh, if a party is just so afraid of the other person that they can't have a, a meaningful conversation with them, that's going to affect that factor. Another factor is 
any family violence and its impact on, among other things, the ability and willingness of any person who engaged in the family violence to care for and meet the needs of the child, the, ap the appropriateness of making an order that would require persons in respect of whom the order would apply to cooperate on issues affecting the child. And finally, the third factor is any civil or criminal proceeding, order, condition, or measure that is relevant to the safety, security, and well being of the child. So, what Parliament has done is they've incorporated considerations of family violence into the legislation. As, as I say, three of the 11 factors to be considered uh, could potentially and do uh, apply to conditions or situations where there's been family violence. The legislation goes on to specify some specific factors relating to family violence, the nature and seriousness, whether there's a pattern to it, whether it's been coercive, uh, whether it's directed toward the child or the child is directly exposed to it, uh, the harm that's been done or that may be done to the child, uh, compromise to the safety of the child or other family members, uh, whether it causes the, viol the violence causes people to fear for their own safety or that of other people, and any steps taken by the person uh, who is the perpetrator to uh, address or deal with those problems, to do something about them. Um, now, having said that, uh, these factors, and I, I didn't go through all 11 of them, but these factors do retain what we used to call the friendly parent principle, which is to say that one of the factors the court is con to consider is the willingness of each parent to cooperate and deal with the other. Um, we're, we're in early days with this legislation, uh, it remains to be seen uh, how they're going to balance those factors and how they're going to approach those factors. Uh, I mean, one thing that causes me, perhaps out of 37 years of cynicism, uh, to be a bit concerned about this uh, is that, you know, it's, it's, it's not news uh, that family violence uh, affects children and affects people who are uh, dealing with uh, parenting issues. Uh, we've known this for a long time. Um, to be frank, I haven't always seen the courts take uh, a lot of uh, cognizance of it when dealing with protection or dealing with um, access or, or custody or parenting issues. Uh, there has certainly been a pretty strong thrust in recent years uh, towards uh, what is considered equality, which is some sort of equal time sharing regime. Uh, and I don't think the courts have always given uh, what with all due respect, I thought was sufficient um, consideration uh, to the relationship or the, the tox toxicity of the relationship between the parents or of the parents with the children. So we'll see if that changes. Uh, we'll see if uh, putting these factors into the legislation makes a difference to that. Uh, I, I hope it does. Um, Again, it's, it's been too many years and too much cynicism, so I'm not entirely optimistic. A um, couple of important procedural advantages uh, to going to uh, civil or family court as opposed to dealing with the criminal uh, process in these matters. Uh, one is the standard of proof. Uh, the standard of proof, uh, as most of us know in a criminal matter is beyond a reasonable doubt and the state has to prove that as against the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator. The standard of proof in a civil uh, case is different. It's on a balance of probabilities and that's because in a civil matter, you've got two people coming to court with different views of the matter and the judge essentially has to choose between the competing stories. He, he or she does not have to find that one party is to be believed beyond a reasonable doubt, he has to find, or he, she has to find that one party is to believed over the other. So that's a significant difference. And the classic instance of that is the O.J. Simpson trial, where he was uh, acquitted in the criminal trial, but in a civil trial brought in on the same facts, he was found to be liable for the deaths of the people uh, that he allegedly killed. The second procedural advantage, and it sort of follows on from the first one, is that in criminal matters, 
the accused is not required to take the stand and subject himself to cross-examination. Uh, and that's a, a very important right for the accused in a criminal matter. Uh, it would be pretty much unheard of uh, for a party to come to uh, the family court and say, I'm not taking the stand to deal with this in my own defense. Uh, so inevitably, uh, the challenger is going to be subject to some form of cross-examination or challenge of his or her story. It's important to know that you're not prevented from using both systems. You can certainly make a criminal complaint and also go and get a protection order or ask the court for a prevention order or, or these other uh, processes that I've talked about. Uh, the other, uh, there's certainly some overlap as well. What we see very often, for example, is uh, bail conditions that may restrict a person even more than uh, a protection order or prevention order might do. For example, uh, they may absolutely prohibit any contact, whereas in a protection order, there is typically an exception to the no contact clause that allows the parties to go to court uh, together uh, under certain circumstances. Uh, that kind of thing can also impact on parenting time and so, and so forth. The thing that I say to uh, clients when they're dealing with these matters and they've obtained these orders is look, You've got an order, it's a powerful tool, but at the end of the day, it's a piece of paper. And if your ex is determined to do you harm, that piece of paper in and of itself is not going to stop them. So you have to be prepared and think about how you're going to look after yourself, how you're going to be careful, how very importantly, you're not going to be shy about calling the police, uh, or calling other authorities if the order is breached, uh, and, and basically not being sympathetic to the other side or letting them get away with anything, because they will, uh, if you give them the inch, uh, to, uh, abusers will almost inevitably reach for the mile. Um, in conclusion, I, I guess what I want you to know is that there are tools that are there. Uh, as you've heard, there are tools in the criminal justice system there are also tools in the family and civil justice system. Uh, sometimes they're not used, sometimes they're misapplied, and sometimes they're unfortunately ignored, but that's where advocacy comes in. That's where the advocacy of a good lawyer comes in. That's also where the advocacy of people in the community who deal with these kinds of situations can come in through advocating for, for victims, through appearing with victims, uh, through advocating with their legislators to do a better job of uh, legislating and, and improving the tools that we already have. Uh, and I've been ignoring the question and answer or the question screen up until now, but uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Victoria and she can let us know if anybody wants to ask me a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A or chat just yet, um, but certainly we do have time in case anybody has any questions that they um, have just been listening and haven't had time to type. Um, so maybe we'll give some time for that. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, um, Wayne or Stacy, do you have anything that you'd like to add kind of in conclusion or any um, additional points that you know you, you didn't have time to make during your um, your initial presentation. Um, we certainly have some time for that too. So um, no pressure, but uh, oh, we do have some questions coming in now. Um, so I can read those out. Um, the first one that we have is, could you please clarify how or why both parties might be charged at the scene of a domestic violence incident? I can address that, although Stacy may be the more logical person. Stacy, are, are you there? Oh, perfect. Go ahead. Well, I, uh, maybe I can address it briefly. Um, what I see frequently and have seen many times over the years is there's a domestic violence call, the police show up um, and basically both parties accuse the other of having assaulted them. Uh, and under zero tolerance, it's believable evidence, which means an accusation in this case, uh, the police are, are bound to lay charges. So they will lay charges against both parties. Uh, and, and that does create some problems uh, in the system. Uh, Stacy would 
probably know this even better than I, but that creates problems because it puts pressure uh, on both of them, uh, but especially the victim, uh, to deal the matter out in some way. And what you often see is prosecutors will say to people, well, both of you agree with peace bond and go away. Uh, the victim may not want to agree to the peace bond, but she also doesn't want to end up with a criminal record. And that's, that, that's an ongoing problem from what I've seen over the years. I don't know if Stacy has anything she would like to add to that. No, I, that's, that's pretty, pretty much what happens is a lot of, I, I think a lot of times the police will take the, like when they, they show up, there's clear injuries on both individuals. Uh, the police will charge both and let the court sort out um, what, you know, what the consequences may be for either one of them. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question that we have is, can you discuss or comment on the court ordered assessment process and how this might come into play? Um, yeah, the, the court can order an assessment um, either uh, through the publicly funded uh, agency, which is called, uh, they just changed their name, the Family Resolution Center. Sorry, Family Resolution, it's not center, but in any event, it used to be called Family Conciliation Services. Uh, and that's a publicly funded uh, operation that will provide an assessment of parenting issues and make recommendations to the court. You get a formal written report that goes to the court. You can also do the same thing through private individuals. Uh, they, of course, charge for their services, unlike the government system. Uh, they're faster. Uh, in some instances, some of us think they're better. Uh, not everyone would agree with me on that one. Uh, but the, the, certainly the advantage of family resolution is it's free, uh, but it's also very slow. It can take anywhere up to a year and sometimes even more. And if the parties, if the parties agree on, a, uh, on an assessment, uh, then they can simply ask the court to do that. Uh, if they don't agree, they can sh go to court and the party and have an argument and uh, a master of the court will either order it, order the assessment or not that point and there's an actual court order for the uh, for the process our next question that we have is at what age do children have input into which parent they live with well at least you didn't say isn't it true that at 12 they can call their own shots because that's what a lot of people come to me and ask and it's I have to disabuse them of that idea there's no magical age um, there's there's no specific age the the views of the children are always relevant uh, and in fact that's one of the factors that the courts are bound to uh, consider uh, of course they become more relevant and more important as they become older and as they're more able to articulate what they want to do and frankly as they're less subject to control of people telling them what to do so if you've got a 17 year old that says i'm going to live with dad then that 17 year old is probably going to live with dad. Uh, if you've got a five year old that says, uh, dad takes me to McDonald's every time I see him and he takes me out to uh, fun places and therefore I wanna live with him, that's not definitive. So um, I have seen situations uh, with uh, young people as old as 13 who were very clearly expressing a desire to live with one parent and the court disagreed with them and, and ordered them to live with the other but their, their views are relevant. And this goes back to the previous question because very often one of the purposes of an assessment is to find out what the views of the child are. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question that we have, um, the person who's asked it has directed perhaps more to Stacy. Um, the question is, how, do, how do the courts look at the new CFS program called Caring Dads in Domestic Violence and the, cr the criminal system um, when it comes to separation and divorce? Well, I haven't had much experience with that. If that's just a Winnipeg, a CFS um, for Winnipeg, because I generally deal with rural dockets for the Indigenous agencies, so I'm not familiar with that specific program, at least in the agencies that I've dealt with. Um, and the criminal system, so that that's my answer with respect to that. I'm going to actually look into it because that sounds 
um, interesting and sounds like something that we should be getting involved with and in terms of the agencies I deal with. Uh, and the criminal system when it comes to separation and divorce. Um, I think one of the things that the court recognizes um, in dealing with domestic violence is that when there is, when the individuals are going through a separation and divorce, um, you know, if we have an accused person, if it's mom or dad, I think that they recognize that there are a lot of different issues um, and a lot of different things that are going on uh, within the context of what happened. So they really just, they really tried to focus on, you know, what is the allegation when it comes to bail court, for example. So everyone is entitled to reasonable bail unless there's, you know, the three different grounds of concerns are met by the Crown Attorney. So for the most part, that person may get out on bail. And it's, um, so, so as I said, you know, the courts are, I, I think, do you have that understanding that, um, that there's a variety of different viewpoints in terms of what's going on uh, if, if an accused is before them and is going through a separation or divorce. Thank you. We, we do have um, some clarification that it looks like the Caring Dad um, program might be a um, GA program. Um, specifically, I'm not sure what that um, that acronym stands for, but um, that clarifying information was provided in the Q&A as well. Um, maybe if you um, would like to provide some more information on the person who, who um, posed that question or, or who added that clarifying information, just to um, add what GA is, um, or Stacy, if you know what that is, if you wouldn't mind. Um. Um, um, so maybe, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Maybe we'll move on to the next question then. Um, oh, general authority, they've clarified. Oh, general authority, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so another question that we have is, what is your experience respecting law enforcement's ability and willingness to enforce protection orders in the context of ongoing family proceedings? Are police typically reluctant to get involved in cases that they may deem a quote unquote lesser breach, such as violating a no direct or indirect contact or communication order? Well, certainly in terms of the people that I deal with who are subject to these orders, uh, I have never, um, I, I have not seen any reluctance on the part of the police to charge them with breaches. Uh, I, I will definitely give the police that much credit. I don't always give them a lot of credit, but I'll give them credit on that one. They charge breaches and they charge them pretty quickly. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, they, they're generally not shy about uh, laying charges. And we do have one more question so far. Um, how does a child who wants to live with one parent over the other go about seeking that when there is a court order already in place? Uh, well, typically what they're going to have to do that through that parent. Uh, they're going to have to make their views clear to that parent, and, and then that parent will have to decide whether they are prepared to raise that issue with court. And that often comes up in the context of what we call variation or change orders. Um, when, when I talked about assessments, there's a specific type of assessment that um, uh, Family Resolution does. It's called a, um, I'm going to forget the name, uh, a, a brief consultation report. And a brief consultation report is often for the specific purpose of getting the views of a child as to uh, their, that child's uh, uh, residence or, or, or uh, custody issues. And typically it's done with older uh, kids. It's done with kids 12 and up. Uh, and it's, um, it's a very summary uh, process. It's a, a brief interview with each parent, uh, sometimes a surprisingly brief interview with the young person uh, and then a report. I'm Perfect. not necessarily a fan, by the way. <clears throat> we do have another question that just came in as well. If there is CFS involvement with the family and the agency has ongoing concerns about both parents, how have you seen the court addressing custody applications by one of the parents? That really depends on how, how involved the agency is. Um, I mean, if, if, they, if they have apprehended the child, then the whole thing, it, it changes the complexity of the whole thing. It, it becomes a different case. Uh, if they are simply involved providing some services, 
uh, it may be important to get a court order to see their file. Uh, you may want to bring uh, one or more of the people involved in as witnesses. Um, in some cases, uh, judges will say, uh, when we're doing our pretrial uh, proceedings, uh, our settlement conferences, they will say, I want the agency to come down here and tell me what they think. Um, so it, it really depends on the degree of the degree and type of involvement that the agency has with the family. And as I say, if you've got uh, an agency coming down and saying that person should not be seeing this child, you know, unsupervised, and, and if anybody lets them do that, we're going to apprehend the child. Uh, that's pretty compelling stuff in your family uh, family uh, parenting case. Yeah, and as agency, we do have to be really careful because the family uh, files are public record and while our information has to be protected for the privacy of the children. Um, so I've been called down to uh, come to court and provide uh, a very delicate, careful opinion. And so oftentimes it's the agency has concerns with mom, but they don't rise to the level of uh, the need for apprehension, our need for protection of child. And so that's sort of, I think people can read between the lines that, you know, if mom is given custody, I think we might be coming in here. Um, so, you know, and then if the child is apprehended um, and there are, there are ongoing custody um, issues such as that, um, sorry, I'm just trying to look for the question again. Um, so the agency, you know, in terms of the apprehension, if there's sort of custody and at, uh, custody issues between the parents in the background, that's something certainly the agency considers. And domestic violence is a protection concern uh, in the child protection system. There's case law on that. And so, for example, um, if mom has, you know, a boyfriend and there's continuous charges, um, she's ending up in the hospital, but she's telling the agency, you know, I want my children back and he doesn't live in the house. But there's information, you know, she's still ending up at the hospital, police are still getting called. Uh, that's definitely a protection concern that the agency would want the parent, the mother to address. 